I V M. कृपया ध्यान दीजिए द लैंग्वेज यूज ऑन द पॉडकास्ट मे नॉट बी फिट फॉर कंजम्पशन वी वॉन्ट यू ट्रेड केयरफुली बट लिसन यार डोंट बी सो कंजर्वेटिव Yes, Cyrus says name of the program. Um, obviously, our sponsors will tell you that. Oh, that's right. We don't have any sponsors. But uh, let's talk about who we have. We have a great guest coming up. Before I bring him on, I want to just say uh, they started charging us money for parking the car in my lane where the office resides, and that's just hugely irritating to go with a hundred bucks on the petrol. The oval maidan being shut, so I can't take my dogs anywhere. And now this. the unkindest cut of fall to charge me to park my car in office i don't want to go to unbelievable so i've decided that i'm going to start a petition to ask for them to return them well the people who were here till 1947 now i don't want any letters uh, no sedition no treason no arresting me this is a bit of very poor satire so please leave it as it is because i can't afford the whole country they're in lockdown in any case so they can't leave their house before forget coming to india Working Monday to Friday glued to your chair making you feel dull? Worry not. Get your 5 minute weekly dose of travel around the world with postcards from nowhere. Join me every Thursday as I explore the strange, obscure and fascinating parts of the world and bring out facets of travel you may not have thought of before. You can find us on the IVM podcast app, website or wherever you get your podcast from. Hugh Cody firstly welcome to the show and uh, this is our second attempt at getting together. Thank you very much, Cyrus. It's a pleasure to uh, to be here. Or, oh, well, I haven't moved, of course. I'm still in Bristol. Ooh, that's right. And you have a second wave there in Gloucester. Did, didn't I? Did I read that somewhere? Yes. Or, or, there, or there's some. We're worried. We're worried about a variant uh, north of where I am at the moment. Uh, yes. Somebody sort of disappeared into the South Gloucestershire countryside uh, with potentially this. Uh, I think it's the South African variant, is it? Or Brazilian, or, or both? Or Brazilian? No, Brazilian variant. That's right. Oh my God, I spend um, more time watching BBC than you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there are so many variants; you can't keep up with them. Fair enough. In fact, sometimes I think that they're taking the Mickey out of us uh, on this variant thing because it's like it seems to have no ending, and then you suddenly think, "What's the point?" Like there doesn't seem to be a you know. I mean, you can just have mutation after mutation. I know. Well, it's in part of the natural cycle of a virus, anyway. So you know, these will come and go over the next decades, probably. But, but, but you guys banned homeopathy, which is the real cause. I mean, the the one thing that can stop anything, according to my mother. Oh, she's been giving it to everybody from cold to cancer. Just three white pills or four white pills, and you're good. Now that's a very controversial subject, Cyrus. Probably won't get into that. All right, <laughs> let's get into your subject. And uh, firstly, it's a pleasure. I, I, I'm a bit of an idiot, so I may ask stupid questions from time to time. But uh, please remember that it's all done with a lot of love and affection, because I miss the British, Welsh, or English, or Irish. A uh, bit of an Anglophile, as you can tell, and I'm not one of those guys that says, "Ah, let's find something original." I'm quite happy. Cricket, the Beatles, Shakespeare, Oscar Wilde. I'm done. All right, uh, let's talk about this show. Very excited. Uh, a brand new show once again idiot human beings may or may not uh, imbibe correctly but the idea is to educate and create awareness conservation is the conversation i like to say those two words together so you take it away tell us what it's all about it's launching next week well first of all i should tell you that it's premiering uh, on the 8th of march at 9 pm on sony bbc earth and it's a five part series looking at the forces of the planet The first four episodes are about the natural forces, about volcanoes, ocean currents, the sun, and weather, and how these natural forces shape our planet and its diversity. And the fifth episode is about humans, the fifth force, the newest force, the force that's destabilizing the other four natural forces, the one that we really need to worry about. The negative protagonist, so to speak. Um, let's can we go through each one of them for a couple of minutes, uh, just to understand. Let's take what is it? Volcanoes first. Yes. So volcanoes. I think most people, if you ask them in the street, if you did a straw poll, they would say that volcanoes are destructive, and our planet would be much better off without them. And of course, they do and have killed a lot of people over the years, uh, and animals, um, and have caused huge problems for for nature. But the simple fact is that you and I wouldn't even be sitting here were it not for volcanoes. Volcanoes have given us our breathable atmosphere. When the planet started four and a half billion years ago, they created the oceans. They're responsible for eighty percent of the land we sit on. They fertilize our planet, so they are fundamental to 
the life on this wondrous planet. Hugh, you've got me. I have to ask the question because being in my 40s and not knowing enough about this, I must understand. You're saying volcanoes created the oceans? Yes. So uh, at the beginning of our planet's history, there was a huge amount of volcanic activity and this created a lot of water vapor. And when the planet cooled, that water vapor condensed like the air in a shower room. And then that's what created the oceans. Wow, what a nice paradox. All right, so uh, what's the deal with volcanoes now? They're less and less and they should be more from a simpleton's guidebook? No, and in fact, it's a balance. I mean, there were various periods in our planet's history when there was too much volcanic activity and it created huge amounts of carbon in the atmosphere and actually created mass extinctions. So there have been five mass extinctions, of which most of them have volcanoes at their core. So we don't want too much volcanic activity, but we can't have too little. Right now, in any one given year, there's about 1,500 active volcanoes around the planet. This doesn't include the ones um, under sea because we can't see them, and actually that's where most of volcanic activity is. But around 30 volcanoes erupt every year, and this obviously throws up carbon into the atmosphere. And you know, at, in, in excess, it would cause issues and change the temperature of the planet. But we will probably get onto this, but if humans have become the new volcanoes, they now, we humans, put more carbon into the atmosphere, 100 times more carbon into the atmosphere than all the volcanoes on our planet combined. Wow. But of course, the other thing to realize about carbon, although we all see it as a destructive gas and because it's warming our planet and creating huge problems, of course, it's also fundamental to life on our planet because it's a necessary gas for photosynthesis. So were it not for carbon, you know, plants couldn't photosynthesize and, you know, we wouldn't have any food chains. So now I'm even more confused than before because basically what you're saying is volcanoes, which I thought was dangerous and you have to avoid, is actually essential. And carbon, which uh, one thought was good, uh, sorry, was bad, is now actually good but yet bad. Yes, it's very complicated. And I can't, I can't begin to sort of be a, a, an expert on this because it is quite complicated. But what I can tell you is that, you know, carbon is an important gas in our atmosphere because it's used in photosynthesis. But when it becomes, the, the, the ratios become too high, obviously it creates a warming planet. So, you know, it blocks off the, the, the it traps the sun's heat. And that is what's happening at the moment. Um, and that's why we need to be worried about the, the burning of fossil fuels and the increase of carbon in our atmosphere. Okay, so uh, Hugh, for the Indian listeners, we have about nine of them. Um, do we have a volcano nearby in our neck of the woods? I mean, because I, again, I'm so sorry that I have no knowledge about volcanoes, except for our leading Bengali politician, Mamta Banerjee, who is known to be a volcano, but that's perhaps not the right example. Anything in the area, South Asia? I'm trying to think. Um, there must Japan, be, for sure? Oh, there, no. there must be volcanoes. I mean, obviously... Um, I mean, you know, funny, you've put me on the spot there, Cyrus. I can't think... Why can't you just lie, act- Hugh? All my guests lie. No, just- I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you why. Because you, you, have an, you probably have huge numbers of extremely knowledgeable, intelligent people listening to your program. And if I say anything that's not true, in fact, probably already you're going to get letters about crap that I've been telling you about. But um, hopefully not. Hopefully I'm on, I'm on a fairly uh, stable wicket at the moment, Where unlike our English batsman. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll get into that in a, in a minute as well if we have time. But uh, let's let's look at the others. So that's volcanoes. Then yes. uh, the second force is Earth. Well, the sun. The sun. The sun. So um, obviously, the sun is incredibly important. One of the interesting aspects of of the sun, in terms of the Earth, is our planet is on a tilt, twenty three and a half degrees, and that means that different parts of our planet get different amounts of sunlight depending on where you are at different times of the year. So as, this, as our planet travels around the sun on its annual journey, the tilt means that different parts of our planet are facing towards the sun at different times. So in the northern hemisphere in the summer, the, the top part of our planet is facing towards the sun. That's why we have summer. And the southern hemisphere is pointing away. That's why they have winter. And then the v- reverse is true six months later. But what's really interesting is despite this tilt, and this tilt is fundamental to life on our planet because it gives us the seasons, but one of the things about uh, the planet is that over the course of a year, every square meter of the planet gets the same amount of sunlight a year. 
So it just happens in different ratios. But uh, so what you're saying is that till that angle was to change, uh, we'd have like different seasons or maybe darker seasons or lighter seasons? Well, we, we like to think of it as a sort of perfect angle because it means that the angle means that uh, no part of our planet becomes unlivable. The more extreme the, the tilt, the more extreme the ends of the Earth. So most planets are tilted, but some of them are so tilted that, you know, you, you'd get sort of like crushingly cold winters or or boiling summers and it would be isn't that happening it wouldn't be yes but not to the to, not to the point yet that animals can't survive in literally every corner of our planet so the tilt is perfect it's not too much not too little you've heard of the sort of uh, it, it's the same is true for our distance from the sun so we are the perfect distance for the sun if we were too close it would be too hot and there wouldn't be any ice. If we're too far away, there'd be too much ice and not enough, uh, not enough water. The great thing about our, our current position, the distance from the sun, it means water could be found in all its three forms, um, ice, uh, liquid, and vapor. And of course, that's very important. And that's why we're also known as the Goldilocks planet, the perfect planet. Do you know the story of the Goldilocks three bears? I do. Most Indians have uh, blonde hair. <laughs> this is a very popular story. Yeah. Uh, anyway, of so we... so it, that's why that's why it's it's sometimes our planet is called the Goldilocks planet. It's just perfect, you know. So there's a lot of cosmic fortune, and the cosmic fortune is the distance from the Earth, the distance from the Sun, the tilt of the uh, the planet, the fact that we have a moon that stabilizes the planet um, and gives us the tides. But you know, those things are sort of out. You know, the things way outside our control. The natural forces are the things that keep our planet going, you know, on a yearly basis and are important to sort of life on Earth. And those are fragile and they're beginning to be changed by humans, the fifth force. So even the most powerful force, the sun, is in danger. We play the villain against the sun as well? Yes, because, because of course, carbon means we're trapping more of the sun's heat on our planet. And that is causing huge problems because, you know, it's affecting our weather, the stability of the planet. So for 10,000 years, a period we call the Holocene, everything has been in perfect balance. So, you know, we've, we've been living in sort of like the Garden of Eden for 10,000 years. Volcanic activity has just been right and all the other forces are working in perfect harmony. And it's because of that stability, humans have been able to evolve these incredible societies and cultures because we could predict the future. And while we can predict the future, we could, you know, we've been able to create these incredible cultures and societies. And that's why we need to worry, because our stability is beginning to be eroded by climate change. And am I correct to say that um, all along, let's say up to the last 100, 150 years, everything was going smoothly. The relationship between human beings and the environment was fine. Yes. And it's just in the last 150, and especially the last 10 or 20, where we've galloped ahead, with destroying the infrastructure that we should have looked after, in a sense? Exactly. Well, it's, you know, the Industrial Revolution, which, of course, all started in the UK. So, you know, (laughs) we're the the big villains I point the finger, young man. I point the finger. You you can point the finger. You know, the, the, the birth of this sort of internal combustion engine is where it all started going wrong. Um, of course, you know, it's been amazing for human society. You know, look at the things it's been able to do for us. But the consequences... We're being, it's being felt now. And the more carbon we put into the atmosphere, the more we are risking our future. You see, I, I think it's, it's just obvious that we just don't know. Like, I don't know. I'm reasonably, well, that's, that's a stretch. I'm slightly educated. But I'm just thinking that across the world, different cultures, different people, they don't pay attention enough. They do a lot of lip service. Everybody says the right thing at the right place and all that. Um, even collective governance says the right thing, doesn't always do the right thing. Uh, so the whole point here is nobody's taking this as seriously uh, as they should, people in, the, in prominent positions. Or is it just uh, the fact that we really... It's just too far gone. You know, the modern world and digital world is just too far gone in one direction. There's stuff to pull back. No, I think people are beginning to take it incredibly seriously. I mean, look at uh, President Biden. One of the first things he did was, you know, reverse what Trump had done with the Paris Agreement. You know, he's gone back into Paris. You know, a lot of his his first proclamations have been on, on the climate. Um, I think most countries are taking this extraordinarily seriously because they know it could destabilize their their communities, their societies. What about China, India, and Russia? How are we doing? 
I think China obviously is is be, you know fingers have been pointed at China with the amount of uh, carbon they produce through sort of coal mining and so on. Um, but I think they will probably change fairly quickly, and I wouldn't be at all surprised that in ten or fifteen years we'll be looking at China as you know leading the way in terms of these alternative technologies. India is the same. I, I don't think India is any different from many other countries. I think uh, your leaders appreciate the, 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 the situation we're in and, and trying hard to, to change it. Of course, it's not easy. It's like trying to, you know, shift the direction of this massive juggernaut. But, you know, it's got to start somewhere. It is already starting. I think, you know, we're getting, certainly in the UK, we're getting more and more of, of our energy from renewable sources. And I think that will increase across the planet. All right. Uh, we'll leave Russia. I'm an optimist. We'll leave Russia out of it. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I suppose that's correct. What's the point of doing all this if there's no a positive force coming through it and uh, no sense of things going in the right direction? Maybe the next generation, that's, that's hope. Mm. People who live in my house and don't pay bills, those kind of people. Um, <laughs> let's move on. So we've got two down. We've got volcanoes and we've got uh, the sun. Uh, what's next? Uh, so weather. Weather. So, you know, weather is... The way we see weather, it's, I suppose it's a more like a climate show, but weather is basically the transport system for fresh water. And it's very simplest. That's what weather is, in, t- in terms of our series, at least. So uh, most of the weather is formed over the oceans. You know, sun heats up water on the oceans, you know, it creates water vapor, becomes clouds. And those clouds are moved around the planet by prevailing winds and the spin of the earth. And where those clouds go are predictable. I mean, India is a classic example. You know, you know about the monsoons. You know, you yeah, believe me. Yeah, you rely on them. So every summer, uh, it starts in June, doesn't it? Yeah, June, July. Something like that. So every June, July, you expect, depending on where you live in India, of course, because it's such a huge country. Mm-hmm. But you know, at a certain time of the year, you're expecting rains, and by predicting those rains, you know when to plant the crops. You know how to sort of, you know, when to get the umbrella out, and so on and so forth. You know, it makes our lives easier. And um, that is the issue is that you know you know if those weather systems were to change which they could do as a result of climate change that means you know we can't look into the future we can't predict but anyway going back to weather it's it's the transport of fresh water uh predominantly from the oceans to land um and you know where it it, it, where these uh, clouds go and where the rains fall varies enormously. You know, in some places you can have masses amounts of rain. I remember when I was growing up, you know, we're doing geography, we were always told, uh, you know, you always look for the extremes and Cherrapunji. You know Cherrapunji? Well, I've not been there, but it's somewhere in our, in our area, yes. Well, I, I, I don't know whether it's changed, but when I was growing up, it, it was always listed as the, the rainiest place on the planet. Yeah, I think it still is. The, we will claim it anyway, even if somebody yeah, claim it. It's, 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 it's a good thing to claim. It's probably where Bristol is probably just underneath. Yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, the other end of the spectrum, you have the Atacama Desert, where some, in some places it might not rain for four or five years, maybe even longer. Maybe there's parts of the Atacama where it hasn't rained for a generation. And so the, the amount of rain is very variable. But at, the thing is, is that where it doesn't rain very much, it's as predictable as where it does rain very much. And as a result, plants and animals have adapted to whatever rain cycle that it has, uh, that a country and a place has. So that's why you can find frogs living in the South African Namibian desert. It's one of our sequences. This beautiful little frog. It looks like a marshmallow, if you have those in India. Little round thing with very stubby legs. And it lives underground. It buries itself in the sand, in the dunes underground. And when it rains or when, you know, at certain times of the year and, and at night, it comes out and, you know, it performs all its vital functions, finds food, you know, mates, and makes the most of the tiny amounts of moisture that, that happen in this particular desert, like, like fog coming in off cold seas or you know, condense on vegetation. And that rain frog is very, very happy. It's not struggling in the desert. It's very happy because it knows it can go underground and come out and find just enough moisture to survive. Do you see what I'm saying? Is no, that- I do. Absolutely. I can, I can take a similar point from our 
let's say an oppressive regime rules over a country and then you adapt to the oppressive regime and realize that you can only say this much and not more, uh, etc. So the frog's doing the same thing. <laughs> My problem is with the analogy of the marshmallow, which I love. And now I don't think I can eat a marshmallow again because I'm going to think of a frog mating with another frog while I eat the marshmallow. So Hugh, that, that is a little twisted thinking, but yeah. It, it, but, but when you see it, if you see the rain frog, you will say, oh my God, that's a marshmallow. It's a little, <laughs> it's, a little it's, it's about the same size and shape as a marshmallow with tiny little legs. The female's bigger than the male, and when the male and female come together, because they've got little stubby legs and can hardly walk, let alone hop, what the male does is glue itself to the back of the female so it can't fall off. So it's like, it's like sticking two pebbles together, or marshmallows. Actually, marshmallows. So, so marshmallows. doggy style becomes froggy style. I, I like that. Frog, yeah, it's a froggy style. Then, and then not only, once they, are, once they couple up, they, then they go surreptitiously underneath the sand to perform the rest of their mating. Because now they're modest, <laughs> suddenly. <Yes. laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think uh, you may agree. I think the French will eat both, the marshmallow and the frog. So we better be careful. <laughs> we'll keep it quiet. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to comment on that. I'm sure you've got French listeners. No, come on. We hard, hardly have any listeners. <laughs> Nationality is not a problem. No xenophobia on this show. Everyone's welcome, <laughs> including frogs and marshmallows. Probably will be our, our way to go. Uh, let's move on then. So we've got, uh, that's uh, the weather. And then there's... So ocean currents, ocean currents. So um, you think, you've got to think of the oceans as just one ocean not separate oceans like the Indian Ocean and Atlantic Ocean. They all join together. And there are these huge ocean currents that circulate water all around the planet. You know, every drop of water in our oceans rides these currents, and it can take a 1,000 years to create a whole cycle. And these currents mostly start at the the, the tops and bottoms of of our of our planet, like the Arctic, where salt water um, sinks into the, into the deep, and that sets in motion these powerful currents. And the currents are important because they're the things that are moving the nutrients around. So if you imagine, if currents stop, it just becomes this vast sort of like stagnant lake. You've got to have currents. You've got to have water movement because it's, you know, things, you know, when things die, when things, you know, uh, drift down, in the ocean, they drift down to the bottom. And that's where all the nutrient base is very often. You've got phytoplankton, of course, that are at the top, photosynthesizing, and they form the basis of a lot of food chains. But they, phytoplankton, they still rely on nutrients being brought up by the currents as well as... But but Hugh, how how would you film the currents? I mean, would you go underwater? I mean, how do I see it? Well, that's a very, very good question, Cyrus. Very good question, because obviously currents are very difficult things to see. So, you know, you, we, we've done it on a few occasions uh, in, the, in the film. So um, we filmed these eider ducks in, in Norway where they feed in these massively powerful currents. And you can see the currents here because the water is passing through a narrow gap and you can see the power of the water moving. But it is tricky. So, you know, what you're trying to do is show animal behavior and use that to illustrate why the behavior is happening in the first place. Like bait balls, for example, these are like the holy grail for wildlife films. These are when huge numbers of animals in the ocean come together in a very small point for quite a short period of time. So for example, shoals of fish come together in, in, in large shoals, they're feeding in nutrients in the currents, and then predators are sort of traveling along these currents, looking for these shoals of fish, and when they catch them, they try to keep them at the surface, stop them going deep down, keep them at surface, corral them into a ball, and then they hammer them, you know, basically to the point where there's literally no fish left, okay? And sharks come, and, and birds, and seabirds come, and dolphins, and all kinds of things. And you know, it's very, very intense, uh, but it can, it can happen like that. And then it can be gone in 15, 20 minutes. So it's a very difficult to film. And they clean up, yeah. they eat up everything. Well, maybe a few stragglers, you know, manage to escape down to the bottoms. But on the whole, you know, a bait ball is here one minute, gone the next. Eat ball, some sort of animal genocide. You can see that. Oh, ouch. Yeah, you can see, oh, Look at the opening sequence in the ocean episode. You'll see what I mean. That was filmed by a South African cameraman. It was filmed off South Africa. And he's filmed, you know, a number of bait balls uh, over the years. 
And he said this was the most intense he'd, he'd ever filmed because it was a big fake ball and it literally absorbed him. He was in the water. The, the, the school of fish just want to school around anything. And they saw him and thought, well, let's, you know, let's use him for safety. And then you had these sharks coming through and wow. dolphins. And I always wanted to ask you that. You know, when we watch these programs, we always argue about that, get really excited. When the predators are around, suddenly you feel the cameraman, of course, with technology, you don't have to be that close. But, but, but he's underwater at the end of the day and, you know, this is a ravenous predator. What do you do? Well, if you're in, on land, of course, when you're filming tigers, you're often filming with a long lens or maybe you're in a vehicle, but you know, you're not close to the animal. In the ocean, you can't be too far away because you wouldn't have any visibility. You know, even in good visibility in the ocean, you mainly get like, you know, 10, 15, 20 meters at the most. So very often you're having to be very close to your subject. Um, and you know, the, the, you can't use a long lens like you can on land. So, you know, you are much closer to those predators than you would be on land. But it's, you know, these, these, the guys we use or the women and, and men camera teams that we use, I mean, they're extremely experienced and they know how to read the signs. And, and there's always safety divers. And you use a lot of them also in case anything happens, you could replace one with the other. I'm so sorry. That was so unnecessary. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> but, I mean, really, why would you take a chance with a great white or a killer whale or, or an octopus for that matter? Sometimes it's, it's mind-boggling the fact that they have nerves of steel because once they're in, they're in. Yes, exactly. It is. I, yeah. It, it's, I mean, you guys are watching them, I suppose, on some feed and there's nothing you can do. Well, the producer director is often in the water, you know, and acting perhaps as, this, as part of the safety team. So were you in? No, not, I wasn't, I wasn't, I'm not really an underwater person, to be honest. Um, you know, I, I, I like water <laughs> and like the, the ocean, but no, I mean, it requires a huge amount of specialization and a lot of training. Um, and, you know, we never just have a cameraman in the water on his or her own, you know, he or she is, is surrounded or very close to other divers who are looking out for his or her back. So, you know, it's, it's very well thought through, I'll have to say. And I, you would expect me to say that as the series producer of this uh, series. Fair enough. There's insurance involved and all that. But for us as viewers, it's quite titillating in a nice way. My wife, uh, for that matter, Aisha, is a photographer. She would love to do what you guys do. And she's the, she wears the pants in the house. I, I'm the caveman who sits at home. <laughs> but uh, she's envious. Is she talented? I know a lot of people, sorry? Is she talented? Uh, she's right have behind you, you... me, so I'll say yes. Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, but but I'm I'm sure that lots of people out there when they see this, you know, remarkable fact that you're so close to nature that you see the, the what did you call it bait night bait ball oh a bait okay. ball a bait ball so in other words wow. a ball I mean, full of bait unbelievable fish. I mean there must that's, be something your head would stand on on you know on on the head top of your head but um yes. okay so that's uh, because of time we have got to gallop through everything which is the next one there's one left I think. Well, there's humans. Oh, how can we forget? So, yes, okay. how can we forget the few humans? And, of course, you know, people say, well, why do you include humans? But, I mean, humans are now a force. I mean, I told you about the Holocene, which is what uh, people call the, the last 10,000 years. And now we're moving into something that scientists are referring to as the Anthropocene, you know, uh, an era that, that is dominated by humans. I mean, look how much we've changed this planet. And look at the impact we're having. It, you know, it would be... I think it would have been a huge error if we did a film about the forces of nature and we didn't include humans because they're having this impact on the natural forces. But, you know, funny, it's very nice because it's a nice circular story because the first four hours we've been through are the natural forces, then the humans are upsetting those natural forces. But actually, the solution to our problems are the natural forces, the renewable energy, you know, the sun's energy, ocean currents, currents can form wave action can create create energy uh you know uh, thermal energy um and and so on and so forth so you know that's what it's it's a rather nice series from a, from that point of view it sort of comes full circle I'll, I'll just ask you one question which is a repeat from the first time we tried to take this plane off the ground and it didn't happen which is i think most of us are worried that it's just too bigger task, too enormous a task to actually you know control your carbon footprint to do the right thing and i think um because I mean, you're talking about living with solar panels and, you know, being politically correct and socially correct in every possible way. So uh, what do we do? The, the logistics, the reality. Yes. 
It is a huge task. Uh, there's no getting away from that. It's a massive task. But every single person can play his or her part because, you know, we've got to start doing something. I mean, no matter who you are, you could do something that reduces your carbon footprint. And that's what we've all got to do. Obviously, we've got to, we haven't got very much time. We've got to make much bigger advances than we currently are. But there's lots of individual things can, that people can do. Eat less meat. I mean, India is actually very good for this because a lot of people are vegetarian. But in the Western world, you know, eat less meat because, you know, uh, cattle, you know, are, are a big problem. You know, we're having to chop down forests to, for, to create food, to grow cattle and, and cattle produce methane. So there's, you know, it's, it's, better for the carbon footprint if you don't eat so much meat, if you cycle to work or walk to work instead of driving, you know, you use energy efficient light bulbs, you, you just create, you know, just use less. That's all. That so everyone, even if you just take one of do. those steps, if you just do one of those things, yes. you're on the right track. Because I yes, think it's absolutely possibly impossible to do everything or even close to that. No, and I agree. And I also think it's 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 not a good move to start wagging fingers, everybody. Yeah. Because that's not going to help to say, oh, you shouldn't be on a flight. You shouldn't be, you know, doing this, that, the other. I think, you know, it, it, that's just not helpful. You know, every, we're all hypocrites. Pretty much, unless you're a carbon neutral person. Ah, unless so. you're a man, you're, 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 you've got a massive beard and you're living in a hole in the ground. And, uh, you know, that's eating half grass. my country. How dare you, Hugh? <laughs> <laughs> Well, then India's got nothing to worry about. The rest of us should, should, should be doing a lot more um, and following in India's lead. But everyone could do something. I, last time we spoke, as you said, when we, when we tried to get the plane off the ground the first time, as, you, as your analogy, um, I mentioned this book called How Bad Are Bananas by a guy called Mike Berners-Lee. Mm -hmm. And he's the brother of Tim Berners-Lee, who entered the internet or, or started the internet. And in that book, it's a very simple guide to daily living. And everything that, you know, we do is sort of listed in this book, you know, the common things we do is listed in the book and the carbon footprint that it has, you know, from plastic bags to, you know, buying fruit. And there are just really simple things you can do to change your lifestyle that will help your carbon footprint. You know, and as I mentioned to you last time, there are lots of things we can do that would make no difference to your standard of living. Because most people see, car, you know, see this climate change as a threat to their standard of living. Oh, I can't do this, I can't do that. Some of the things we can change and you won't even notice. You know, buying fruit and vegetables in season instead of buying them from you know, the other side of the planet, which, might, which means they've had to get onto a plane and, and all the carbon that involves. So there's loads- I can do that. And you can do that. But I think, you know, and again, it's something I mentioned last time is that you know, we all know when we go into a supermarket what calorific content food has. You know, people are sort of, you know, quite aware of that now. You go in and if you, you know, if you pick up a chocolate bar, you know that's going to have higher calories than an apple. And what we've got to do is we've got to go shopping with a carbon footprint uh, knowledge in our head. So we say, well, okay, I'll buy that. But to buy that, that carbon footprint is going to be, you know, X, okay? Do I want that? Or should I go for something with a smaller carbon footprint? Literally, maybe it should every single product should, like calories and you know, and and where it's made, have something on it that says the carbon footprint of this item is this, and you can make a choice. But that'll be like cigarettes and uh, the ones with the large carbon print. Uh, I mean, they wouldn't want to keep it on the label, would they? Yes, but you know, maybe we gov that's what governments that's that's where governments are important. They just step in and say, look, we need to do this. We need press us. Yeah, <laughs> charging too much for parking. Uh, you guys, in, at least in London, I, I know you're Welsh, but um, I, nobody drives cars anymore. This is what they do, governments. They make you cycle, so you win at the end. Yeah, yeah, well, actually, you know, over the pandemic, it's quite incredible. You know, cities across the country, um, councils have been changing the, the sort of the, the roads to make it more uh, cycle and pedestrian friendly. And actually, the, some of the car owners are up in arms. But, you know, it's the way we have to go. People have got to get wise. You know, we just can't carry on doing the same old thing. Yeah, there's a big difference, though, culturally, because you guys, the cyclist is king uh, on the road, and the car sort of has to give way and allow the cyclist to uh, carry oh, on. Oh, don't you believe? Don't you believe it, Cyrus? I'm a cyclist, and uh, <laughs> not, not every not everybody feels that way. I can tell you, um, but yes, we have a lot of cyclists, uh, and it's probably one of the most popular 
you know, hobbies these days, it seems. I mean, if you want to buy a good bike now, it's about five month waiting list. Yeah, but I, I, I could think that could be a revolution. I know the car lobby and the diesel and gas lobby will fight to the nail and all that. But I, I can see that happening maybe in the next few years where people say, what the hell? I really don't need a vehicle unless I'm going really far. You know, that, that yeah. could happen. But it's going to be, it's, going to, it's being made more convenient all the time. You need to get past that critical mass. Electric cars are here. Okay, every single car manufacturer are building electric cars. Um, and it needs to get to that critical mass where, you know, owning an electric car is convenient. There are charging spots everywhere. And then people think, oh, I'll have an electric car. And suddenly, you know, you're not polluting the cities in which you live. You're burning less fuel, assuming, the, obviously, the, the energy, the electricity you're using to charge your battery comes from a renewable source. But of course, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a stage. And then, of course, you'll get to a situation where maybe people don't need cars because you know, there are driverless electric cars everywhere and you'll just get your phone out, out and, you know, go to the app and say, you know, I want a car now and one will turn up without a driver mm -hmm. and take you somewhere. I mean, don't forget, a car spends 23 out of every 24 hours probably parked on a pavement. I mean, true, completely useless. But this is why, Hugh, I feel, you know, we should allow for poverty because when you're poor, you don't have a car. So maybe that's one way of looking at it. Just keep the people poor. Nobody can buy the car electric or otherwise, and you're stuck. Run or maybe cycle. Maybe share a cycle, certain countries. You pay no attention, but quickly, as we go into break, a uh, couple of personal questions. I was going through your biodata, the kind of work you've done. I mean, uh, Richard Attenborough, the Tigers, this, that. I mean, there's so much. David Attenborough. Oh, sorry, David Attenborough. Right? Uh, yeah. Richard Attenborough fan because we watch the film every year. You know which one. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. It's, it's something <laughs> we have to do, apparently. Uh, but coming back to you, so how did the young Hugh get into all this? What was, if you could just recall your, your trip? Yes. Well, the young Hugh. All the way here. No, uh, when I was very small, uh, I was just really interested in, in animals. That was, that was my key interest. I wasn't interested in training and planes and automobiles like a lot of boys. Um, I was fortunate in the sense that uh, uh, I lived in lots of different countries. My father was a geologist for an oil company. Uh, oil company. It's not so good. So, sounds so good now. Hey, hey, but, hey. It, but anyway, back in the day. And... Um, and he he was posted lots of different places. So, uh, you know, our family traveled and, and lived in different places. So I had access to lots of different kind of wildlife. And so I was always passionate about wildlife. It was a natural interest. And then um, I was thinking, you know, from from the age of about five to 12, I really want to be a wildlife photographer. That was my dream. Mm -hmm. And then at school, uh, I stopped doing all science subjects, uh, which, wasn't a, which wasn't good for getting into this business. Uh, our school had very bad science teachers. I hope none of them are listening now. But uh, the, which, which school is that? Just to <laughs> belabor the point and make sure they do. I, I probably better not mention it because they had very good We can Google subject. it. Hugh, they can <laughs> Google it in a minute. It'll be all yeah, over the net. <laughs> he denies his school teachers. No, no I'll tell you. It was, a, it, was, it was actually a boarding school in Somerset called Downside and it was run by monks. Ian Botham Country. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. And uh, anyway, uh, and they had great arts teachers. And so I sort of like found myself channeled into the art subjects. So I just figured that when I left school and then went to university to do history and politics, that my dreams of being in, a, in the wildlife film business or the wildlife photography business is, was over. But um, my girlfriend uh, at university, who is now my wife, Lizzie, she was a geography graduate and she got a job with an independent production company in London, the only one making wildlife films. And... Uh, she got the job with the, the company first and, um, and was able to tell me uh, when a job came up. They didn't know we were together and I went for the job and got it. Although I should say that in the intervening period between me getting a job and, and her being there, I did an expedition film for the BBC. It was a very, very competitive thing to get onto. There were like 80 or 90 groups applied the year we did and uh, they select only four groups. And we were going to cycle across Tibet this was in 1989, never been wow. done before. And I thought this was, you know, I was very lucky to get on to it. There were two other guys who I didn't really know, but I was on as the videographer. And uh, we were due to go in, uh, I think it was about May or June. And we got sponsored by Ridgeback, which was a cycle company. And everything was looking good. And we'd been selected for the Mick Burke Award, this BBC Expedition Filmmaking Award. And two weeks before we were due to go, they closed the borders to Tibet. Kashmir. Yes, no, to Tibet. Yeah. To Tibet. So our alternative was to cycle across the Himalayas. This is the 
reason for the story, bring it back to India. And so I did this massive cycle trip across the Himalayas with these two guys. We made a little film and it went on, on, on TV. It was a very, very bad film <laughs> because we were, the cy- we were the cyclists as well as the filmmakers. And of course, when anything interesting happened, we were on the bikes. Anyway, notwithstanding the terrible film, uh, it was good for my CV. And so I, when I went for my job interview at Partridge Films, this film company that my wife or girlfriend at the time was working in, I got the job and then started for nothing, started low down, general assistant making tea. And uh, here I am today. Wow. I'll, we'll put in the relevant music. Don't you worry. Um, <laughs> just, just, just quickly to understand. So, uh, but you've you've shot wildlife because you love animals. You've you've come close to the tiger. Uh, yes. Well, tell us about some of the hair raising moments. There must have been some. Oh yes, there have been some hair raising moments. Uh, well, I'll, I'll give you a couple of. I'll give you an India one, for example. Um, so I, I worked on a series called Land of the Tiger. Yep. Uh, with Val McThappa. Do you do you know who Val McThapper is? Well, of course. Very, yeah, yeah, Mr. Tiger, Tiger yeah. Very, yeah, he had very large in life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, big beard, beard and, very, yeah. yeah, very powerful. Looks a bit like a tiger powerful. himself, yes. <laughs> well, he, it's a tiger personality. He's very, For you sure. know, he's quite fierce. He's quite fierce. Um, and, you know, on this series, I got my first opportunity to see a tiger. And un- unbelievable. It's still one of my most memorable sights, seeing the tiger for the first time, which was in Bandavgar. But... I was doing this film in the south in Karnataka. No, it, it was in Ter- it was in Tamil Nadu in um, in Animalai. That sort of those sort of um, what are they, I've just forgotten the name of the mountains there. Um, you know, there's the spine that runs down. Producer, find out the mountains in Tamil Nadu quickly. Uh, the, the the Welshman and the Indian have no idea. So <laughs> you know what it's back. like. It's, I was just trying to kind of just went. But anyway, I was in. I was in, there were tropical forests there, and I was in this tropical forest with a camera man and we found a very brightly colored snake and uh, I thought oh that's nice well let's get a few shots of the snake you know it's, it's not going to be a sequence but just sort of like capturing the atmosphere of this jungle and so we got so the cameraman got down low and we filmed this snake traveling through the leaf ledge and it looked pretty good and and the, the guy turned to me um, David Shell, the cameraman's name was and he said oh let's get another shot of that why don't you just bring the, the snake back a little bit and um, and we'll just do that again and I was like Mm, okay. And he said, no, that's no, fine. It, this is just a, a false mimic. This is, it looks venomous, but it's actually not. It's one of the, it's one of the sort of mimics. Okay. So it's pretending to be venomous. And this guy was a, was a herpetologist. So I thought, well, he, he knows of, about snakes. So, oh, okay. So I, I picked the snake up very carefully, gently, not harming it. Ouch. And I moved it back, you know, 20 feet or something. And it went through the you know, went through the leaf litter and, you know, it was, it was great. By the way, this is back in the nineties, you know, we, we don't tend to do this anymore. Um, and so we got the shot and he, and he, we got a few more shots and then he said, well, you know, maybe we should just get a shot of it going over these rocks or something, but it, the light had gone. So he said, well, let's just put it, we'll put it in this sort of like a snake bag. So we had a little tied canvas bag and we and I just picked the snake up and I dropped it in the bag and tied the thing. I was just carrying it around. And I, as I was carrying it, I looked down and there was all this gloopy uh, liquid sort of dripping out of the bottom of the bag, which was venom. And this snake wasn't a mimic at all. It was one of the highly venomous snakes that this cameraman had just got me to pick up uh, uh, several what times. was it, a, a viper? No, uh, to be honest, I, I can't quite remember. This is 25, 30 years ago. Because a cobra you'd have been able to pick up. No, oh, no, no, it wasn't As a cobra. No, I mean, that, that, would, that would have been obvious. But, but I have to say that, um, you know, interactions with wildlife, I mean, like that, I mean, they don't happen a- did they, anymore. Did the young boy and you, you know, recall your dreams of being with these animals and suddenly you're in the middle of a forest with a ferocious yes. serpent or the lord of the jungle or an elephant. But Cyrus, here's the thing that, you know, I'm never frightened of the animals. It, you know, you're, you're much more frightened about the people, you know, and getting in cars in certain places and the quality of the roads. I mean, generally speaking, the, the animals are the least of your worries. I've been very, very fortunate, I have to say. I've traveled to, you know, probably 70 countries and seen some amazing wildlife, including lots of large predators, um, animals that could be a, an issue, and lots of small predators that could also be an issue, like, you know, venomous uh, snakes and spiders. But the thing I worry about most are definitely people and cars 
bad roads. Who are the scariest people, you? Oh, I couldn't well, possibly say. Of all. Angry people. Okay. Angry people. Those okay. are the scariest people. Well done. Well played. With a straight yeah. back, you. Excellent. Yes. Better than the boys are doing <laughs> in Ahmedabad as we speak. I know. So we'll take a quick break. Yeah. We'll take a quick break. Sorry, we'll take a break. We'll come yeah. back. And now we'll ask you questions which are coming in from, because this is a fascinating topic for lots of people. We don't get this very often, so we'll milk it a little bit if you yeah, don't not mind. At all. So in a second, we'll be back with Hugh Cordy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you aren't following us on social media, please do. IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. We'd like to thank the sponsors on our network this week. See you at Tires. So we had a fantastic week. Tune into This Round is on Me, where Gauri Devideal has a chat with Divya Ravichandran on the issues of waste management in India and how recycling, composting, and using eco-friendly alternatives can help. On Filter Coffee Podcast, Karthik speaks with Lux Narayan about his book, Name, Place, Animal Thing, an inspiring non-fiction fable about hope, positivity, and living your best life. On All Things Policy, Anirudh Kaniseti talks to Pratik Wakre and Rohan Shed about Australia's conflict with Facebook and Google and what this means for big tech companies and the news ecosystem. On the Simplified Podcast, Narayan and Tony talk about greenwashing, which is businesses unfairly marketing themselves as eco-friendly just to ride the sustainability wave. You should also check out the Cyrus Says episode with Varun Deshpande of the Good Food Institute where they talk about plant-based alternatives. Varun does a great show with us called Feeding 10 Billion. Do check out this episode of Cyrus Says. They have a really interesting conversation. On the Millennial Athlete, Tanvi and Shlok speak to the badminton doubles player Satvik Sairaj about his successful stints at some of the recently concluded games. And with that, let's get you back to your show. Follow me at Instagram and Twitter on Board Brocha. I'm so bored, I need your help. I need your love. I need your touch. Okay, just, just, just follow me. Silvri? Hello, hi. Just getting the producer on. Good looking young man. 12 years old with a beard. Yes. Um, All right. Are we good to roll? Yes, let's go. Uh, the first AMA question comes in from Harshil Shah. Uh, he says, uh, Hi, Silas and guest. Hi, Silas and Hugh. He says, uh, Hope you're doing well. Ever since I was a child, I've been a huge fan of wildlife documentaries like those of Discovery Channel, National Geographic, Animal Planet, etc. etc. Uh, Some uh, of the BBC, planet documentaries Sony, voiced. Uh, to be mentioned first. He didn't, yeah. actually, he, he didn't mention. Sony, Sony BBC Earth. He did? Okay, that's good enough. Did, All right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, some of these planet documentaries voiced by the great Sir David Attenborough are truly, are truly mesmerizing. Firstly, Cyrus, have you ever had the chance of meeting or interacting with Sir Attenborough? And secondly, considering your love for animals and the environment, would you ever consider narrating these kinds of documentaries? Yeah, I thought he had the easier job all said and done then towards the second half <laughs> of his life. Uh, but let, let Hugh uh, enlighten us because he's actually experienced... Uh, Yep. The David Attenborough culture. Yes, I, I have been, again, very, very fortunate to have uh, worked with Sir David on numerous occasions. Uh, my first uh, relation, working relationship with him was back in sort of late 90s, early 2000s, when we were doing Life of Mammals. And uh, he was the presenter of that. And so I, I traveled around the world at lots of different destinations uh, filming him and we did come to india actually on that series twice we went to the rat temple of deshnok and the kumela uh david's loves famously loves all wildlife but uh rats he didn't particularly like so it probably wasn't a me- probably wasn't a memorable trip for him um but you know david is now 94 years old uh coming up to 95 and he's still going strong I mean, he just did a, a speech for the UN Security Council last week, which uh, our company filmed, as a matter of fact. And he still got the same enthusiasm, still wants to communicate messages. Right now, of course, he's very, very you know, focused on the issue of climate change. Um, but he's just an amazing communicator, you know, obviously, a, a, you know, a huge intellect. Uh, but, you know, when you're traveling with him, he's got a very good sense of humor. He's a great raconteur, as you can imagine, with somebody with his range of experiences. Um, you know, he was always he was always sort of wanting to muck in. He's very modest. I mean, I remember, you know, being in restaurants in various places and uh, somebody would come up to him and say, oh, Sir David, you know, coming, just a member of the public coming up to our table and would say, oh, Sir David, oh, how lovely to see you. I'm, you know, I saw your last series. I thought it was fantastic. And, and he would look at this person and go, oh, really? Oh, you, you saw it? Oh, well, how lovely. Thank you very much indeed. He was always sort of, sort of self, 
you know, sort of modest and self-deprecating. Um, you know, just a very easy person to be around. Um, you know, doesn't suffer fools gladly, for sure. But, uh, which, you know, obviously can be an issue with people like me. But, you know, he was generally, a, you know, one of the crew, always help, wanted to muck, you know, muck in, you know, carry bags. I mean, he didn't even go business class until he was in his what? 80s. Yes, I'm not joking you. Why? Yes, so let this, Why let me tell, you're a legend? Well, let me tell all those, all your famous and uh, celebrity guests or, or listeners out there, Cyrus, that David Attenborough went economy class, you know, when we were doing Life of Mammals, and he carried on going economy class until I think he was in his 80s that he stopped and started going business class. So, you know, he's not a prima donna. Oh, some would say just being cheap, but uh, I wouldn't. A lot of respect. <laughs> Did he? No, maybe he just didn't know he was eligible for a business yeah. class. <laughs> yeah, well, I said, well, some, <laughs> so, so, no, sometimes you know, you'd queue up and, and uh, the check in staff would look at David and say, well, can we upgrade you, David? And he would say, well, I, I'm only going to be upgraded if you upgrade the crew. Wow. And uh, could, have know, a, was, could have been a fine politician. No? Nature's gain exactly, was politics's exactly. loss. Wasn't he instrumental yeah. in bringing Monty Python in as well? Exactly. Yeah. Everyone thinks of David as just being uh, the face of wildlife. And of course, that's a massive accolade in itself, uh, given what he's done for, for natural history. But he was also, um, you know, nearly the director general of the BBC. In fact, he would have been had he stayed on, but he was controller of BBC One. He brought colour television in. He was responsible for that. He introduced snooker on television, I think. And there were loads of accolades that he had from his days as being a television exec. Um, so, yeah, you know, done some amazing things that are not connected to uh, TV. He also has an incredible collection of tribal um, artifacts. Um, you know, he's just interested in lots of different things. I love a life, Silvery, not like you and me. We just sit in our silly homes, wait for COVID to disappear and nothing happens. This man's been, uh, he was gone himself to 70 odd countries and seen some 10,000 cultures and animals. And what have we done? Our lives are passing us by. All right, next question. All right, next question comes from Shivani Kerlekar. Uh, Shivani Kerlekar asks, Dear Cyrus and guest, I'm an intern at a film production house in Mumbai. I don't think my workplace really cares about interns though. They're not interested in teaching us, not interested in doing anything that could help us find our footing in this industry in the future. We just sit around most of the day doing nothing. According to you, what's the skill or what aspects of filmmaking should we as interns be learning at this point so that we can have a future in this industry? Okay, so Hugh, this one's back to you again, but this is your other side as a member of a production well, this is an obvious answer here. You've just got to make really good tea. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when, when, when I left university, you know, with a degree, my first job was working in Soho in London in a post-production facility. And I did nights uh, and days. We, we did 12-hour stretches for virtually no money. And uh, we made tea and got Chinese meals for people at the middle of the night. And, um, you know, that, joking aside, I mean, a lot of people have started like that. And I think in answer a proper answer to your, your listener's question is that she, what she should definitely not do is sit around because, you know, she's got to somehow show that she's got enthusiasm, drive, and motivation. So even if they, if they don't appear to be interested in her, she must try to push through that because someone will notice her and they'll say, oh, this is a can-do person. You know, when you are at the bottom and you're trying to start off, people are looking for two things, you know, a motivated person and somebody they can get on with. And if they see somebody just sitting around doing nothing, it might, even, it might be justified because maybe they don't really care about the interns. But you've got to forget about that because if you want to get on, you've just got to focus and say, look, I'll do whatever it takes. Within, so tell, I mean, within within reason, within reason, obviously, no. you know, within the reason of the job. You know, to, to take the point further, he was spot on, I think. Just tell her to wear really bright clothing. Uh, I think in our dull climate, sometimes you're not able to see people properly. It's good to wear bright clothing. Just catch the eye. And then what Hugh says applies, you know, just be more exuberant and out there so they notice you. Worst case, if they sack her anyway, what difference does it make, really? All right, next one. All right, next one comes in from Jalasmi Rakesh. Uh, she says... Uh, hey, Cyrus Silvery and guest. You remember in the beginning of the pandemic, when global lockdowns and shutdowns started happening, we would hear cool stories about how animals were slowly recovering their habitats from human occupations slash hazards. 
I sometimes feel that it's almost worth it to be working from home and to have these shutdowns like this so that animals can reclaim some of their homes. That's a good point. What you, are your thoughts? What do you do you think this is at all you, We got the sparrow back yeah. here in South Mumbai, which we hadn't seen for years. Suddenly it returned. I thought it was gone. Yes. The, the small sparrow. And it's gone from the it's gone from the UK. I mean, the numbers of sparrows have absolutely collapsed, but that's another story. It's absolutely your listener, what she just or he shared, I don't who was it, he or she? She. She. Uh, she, she said it's abs- absolutely true. Um, you know, animals have been able to reclaim certain places. I mean, I, I, did you see that um, those amazing sites of the flamingos in Mumbai last year? I mean, yes, they do yes, come yes. every year, but they were in fantastic numbers, which I think is partly a result of the lockdowns. But, but and, and abs- actually, there's been a huge, another sort of uh, unexpected benefit of the lockdown and pandemics. Far fewer animals have been killed on the roads. And when you think, you know, huge numbers, and I mean massive numbers of young animals are killed every summer on, you know, roads in the West. Um, you know, those animals, uh, you know, are now out there enjoying their lives. So, uh, you know, obviously populations, some animals must have gone up. But, but here's the thing, it's not quite as good as you might think, because with nobody traveling around, with no tourism, there's no money going into these reserves and parks. Park rangers in some places have had their salaries cut by, you know, down to a fifth. Um, and with little money, you know, they've, how are these families going to make a living? You know, maybe they've had to exploit the very places they, they, they would normally protect. Maybe they've had to, you know, chop down trees, grow plants, you know, poach some animals for food. I mean, you know, with no money coming in, what are these people to do? So, you know, there has... There is a, a worrying aspect to the lockdowns and the lack of tourism. And perhaps we need to think, this is a wake-up call, maybe we need to think about how we can fund these amazing reserves, these wild places, of which India has got phenomenal wild places because I've been very lucky to, to, have, to have been to them. You know, how are we going to fund these places which doesn't wholly rely on tourism? You Let me just clarify for the young man. Silvery is only 16 years old. Silvery by, by you know, wild places, he doesn't mean the discotheque and all that you used to go to in the old days. Oh, okay. There's actual oh, forests thanks, with thanks. animals that exist uh, in our country, which we don't know about because <laughs> we live in this stupid city, which is going nowhere at the moment. Um, that's, very, that's worth pointing out, Cyrus, yes. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Slap for the day. Uh, Silvery, one more. Can we squeeze in? One last one, yes. Yeah. Uh, this last one comes in from Rohini. Uh, she says, Hi, Cyrus, Silvery, and guest again. Uh, what can we as humans do to safeguard the polar bear? They are on the verge of extinction, and I find it very hard that there's nothing we can do, and they're just being killed and being taken uh, taken. More than killed, there's no food, right, Hugh? There's no food for them, yeah. food source. This is, this is a very difficult subject because, um, I mean, polar bears aren't being killed directly by humans on the whole of course you know some some in some places they they get hunted um you know by traditional people but you know the bigger problem is what's happening to their habitat so you know they live in the uh, in the northern part of our planet in the arctic and you know with melting ice it's becoming more difficult for them to hunt their favorite food which are seals um and so this goes back to the subject that we were talking about earlier cyrus about what we can do to reduce the impact of climate change. Because that's how we save polar bears, reducing our carbon footprint. Isn't it incredible to think that, you know, an animal that's like so far from away from us, most of us will never ever see in our whole lives, you know, is being affected by what we're doing, you know, three or 4,000 miles to the south. But that is what's happening. You know, each year there's less ice. Uh, it's more difficult for these polar bears to hunt. And yes, it's gonna it's gonna affect their populations. So you know, this is climate and change. So how bad is it right now, Hugh? Is it uh, possible to reverse the situation, or is it really, really bad? Because I've read some horribly negative articles. Well, a lot of scientists that study the subject talk about the tipping points. You know, you get to such a point where doesn't matter what you do, you've already gone over the edge, you know, and the, the big tipping points are things like the melting of the Arctic ice, uh, the deforestation of the Amazon, um, you know, overfishing, you know, the permafrost in, the, in Siberia, you know, the, it gets to a point if the temperature of the planet goes up too much and creates a cascading effect on these huge 
areas that stabilize our planet, then we're in trouble. But I don't think we've got to that point. Look, I'm not a you know, I, I'm the first to say I'm not an expert in this. You know, I, I would say I'm knowledgeable. I've got a keen interest, but I'm not expert on all the data. But my feeling and uh, the feeling of the people I work with is that it's definitely not too late. There are things we can do, but time is running out. We really need to make big changes in the next decade, you know, and that's not a long time. We've got we've got the tiger in trouble, the polar bear, so many other populations getting closer to extinction. What about my tribe, the Parsis? There are very few of us left. Can you help with that, you? <laughs> Can you do a documentary? We'll go underwater for you. I, I, I'm, you you've, you've, I'm not always stuck for words, Cyrus, but I'm not sure what to say about the Parsis. Uh, you'll have to give me a bit more detail. <laughs> you... You you save you save the polar bear. We're a tribe that came from Iran okay. and settled down here when the yeah. Islamization happened there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So a small group ran, came to Gujarat, west of India, and settled down here. Now because of uh, policy where you're not allowed to marry outside, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, to cut a long story short, there's about seventy thousand left, and uh, we're down to a tribe status literally. And we well, the tipping point has happened with us apparently. Oh dear. Yep. Yes. Well, it doesn't sound like there's. No, it, it's, I don't think your tipping points reach. It sounds as if there's still hope, and uh, I'm sure you can come back. I should probably know more about the subject since my wife is half Iranian. Um, oh, exactly. Please ask her. She will know. Yes. They threw us out. <laughs> <laughs> in a manner of speaking. No, I'm just kidding. Listen, it's been wonderful talking to you. I want to ask you one last question before we wind up and uh, say bye-bye. Um, if you was you know, born an animal, and this is such a tough question, which, which animal would that be? Who's your token animal or totem animal? Oh, God, yes. Uh, you, you'd, you'd like to think it would be something, you know, initially you would say, oh, it's got to be something with a long life. Like I was very, I was very lucky. I went to this amazing atoll, uh, coral atoll in the Indian Ocean called Aldabra, very, very remote, un, uninhabited place. And on this atoll were these giant tortoises. And there's 100,000 of them on this island. And these giant tortoises, some of them were over 200 years old. They were 250 kilos and wow. 200, 250 years old. So you might think that's quite a good animal to be because they live a long time. But actually, they have a little bit of a boring life, you know, and they don't... They don't yeah, it's like being in lockdown. Yes, they sort of wander around very, very slowly, eating not very much. I mean, they're fascinating, but probably not, not that. And then you think, oh, a predator like a tiger, that would be absolutely amazing. Or a leopard. A leopard is one of my favorite animals because they're just phenomenal. And I think a leopard would be a great thing to be when it was in its prime. I mean, the thing about being a predator, when they sort of slip out of their prime, oh, it's not a very nice life. So I don't know. A bird of paradise, how about that? A bird of paradise. I like the tortoise. <laughs> 250 <laughs> kilos of muscle and doing absolutely nothing. Oh, that's life. <laughs> Silvery, what's your spirit animal? Uh, 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 there is a leopard in uh, roaming around in with around my area right now, just Pauai. out in the wild. Because yeah, yeah in Pawai, because it just happens uh, like often enough, like about once in two years, there'll be a random sighting of a leopard in some building somewhere. So that happens. Often. Yes, uh, I mean it's part of the one of the reasons why I admire them so much because a leopard can come into a city like Mumbai and, and survive, and go around, yeah. and yeah, survive taking dogs off the off doorways. Yep. And, I mean, and piglets and such exactly. like. I mean, amazing animal, absolutely amazing. All right. If I had to pick an animal, I would be uh, an octopus because uh, an octopus can just camouflage uh, with anything. Yes. So if the octopus very... doesn't have a penis. It doesn't? Oh, well, works out. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> I don't have to Good I don't choice, worry about dating apps, yes. finally. <laughs> o o also, octopuses don't live very long. They're very intelligent. Oh, they don't? No. I th they have heart okay. issues. I, I, th I don't think they live very long. They can. Some of them only live just two or three years. Cyrus, you haven't said what your spirit animal Ooh, is. Uh, I would like to be a wolf. I'm a pack animal. Uh, this is my favorite animal. They made for life. See, see, see. Yeah, and, nice. Uh, yeah, the social conditioning of the wolf is my thing. But then I don't look like a wolf, so I'll just, I'm happy to be a seal. <laughs> <You're>... <laughs> I'm sacrificing myself for a polar bear. Go ahead. You're a wolf in sheep's clothing. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, a wolf, a, a wolf is a, yeah, that's a, that's a, that is another very, fabulous very cool animal. animal so. well, some, fabulous. I'm, I'm dog crazy, so the wolf is, you know, one cousin away, so that's also important. Yeah, 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 ex yeah. exactly. Amazing animals, amazing. Um, All right. Awkward pause yeah. as we come to the end of this show. Well, no, I, th I, I thought you were going to say something, so I stopped. No, no, but I thought you were carrying on about the wolf because we've learned so much from you. Oh. We've, we've actually kept quiet for a lot of the show. Uh, well, I, 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 I filmed wolves. I could tell you an anecdote about filming wolves. Please do. Um, 
Well, okay, so we filmed Wolves in Newfoundland, oh, not Newfoundland, in, in, um, in northern Canada. Um, and these wolves just, they, what's astonishing about wolves is their stamina. Okay, so these wolves would set off from their dens and they would just trot and run for mile after mile and mile. We were following them in helicopters, you know, with very powerful gyro-stabilized camera systems. And, you know, if they saw a caribou, then they would start running at it and they would just run and run and run. It seems like they had ceaseless energy. It was extraordinary. And uh, obviously in, uh, I should mention, um, in, um, in Perfect Planet, the series that, you know, this has... The you must plug Perfect Planet, out. for sure. I'm going to plug Perfect Planet because we filmed Wolves. I'll Wolves. say it again, Perfect Planet. Yeah. Yes, uh, 8th of March, 8th premiering of March. on Sony BBC Earth. Sony BBC, yeah. yes. 9pm. 9 9pm. 9 um, and we filmed Wolves in Ellesmere Island in the high Arctic in Canada. And these are white wolves. And we filmed them at night in the, in the Arctic winter. And it's just astonishing. I mean, it went down to minus 50. Okay, one of our cameramen got got frostbite on his cheek and these wolves are happily just walking around and they survive in this this twilight world for like four or five months they don't hibernate obviously and they try to catch these huge hairy beasts called musk oxen and they're pretty formidable but as a pack they manage to they can overcome come them um and then we also film them hunting arctic hares so in the winter arctic hares are white because of the snow, and they gather in these huge sort of herds that nobody had ever filmed before. In fact, nobody really knew much about them. It was almost anecdotal, but we saw it and filmed it. And do please have a look at the sequence in episode two of A Perfect Planet, because the, the, the shots of these wolves chasing uh, Arctic hares in these huge herds is quite something. And you never try to stop and, you know, feeling bad for the, uh, the prey, sort of stop the, stop the hunt. Would you ever do that? I mean, it's 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 an interesting question in the sense that you know we are emotional animals ourselves, and it's hard to see uh, some prey animals being caught and torn apart. But of course, as wildlife filmmakers, we never ever ever get in the way of nature. Uh, I mean, when I was working on a, on a previous series uh, called The Hunt, uh, we were filming wild dogs chasing wildebeest, and wild dogs they've got small mouths, and when they trap a wildebeest they bring it to the ground but they can't do a, a neck hold like a tiger or a lion or a leopard and so they just eat the thing alive and it's the most <sighs> horrific thing to watch but wild dogs are so impressive i mean these african hunting dogs it's just so unbelievably impressive like the wolf but you can't help but admire them but it's not a sort of it's not a thing you want to watch for sure it's it's really quite disturbing but you know why should a prey uh, predator not get its food like a you know a prey is, is able to eat and the predator has to have the same rights. So yeah, we never we never intervene. It's like McDonald's. You have to serve everyone end of the day, <laughs> which is something we should remind people eat less meat. Yes. That's one way to reduce the carbon footprint. Well, yeah. You, this has been great talking to you. Uh, took us two attempts, but I think we've come out with the perfect program for the perfect planet on Sony BBC Earth. So, so please check it out. It's on 8th March at 9 p.m., and uh, lots more from Hugh, lots more documentaries left in his arsenal. We'll get to see that as well. Uh, in the meantime, it's bye-bye from all of us. And it's uh, what, lunchtime for you? Uh, coming up, yeah. I think it's, yeah, 12.30. But you can't yep. go anywhere, so. <laughs> yeah, no, it'll, I'll go downstairs to my kitchen. Oh, excellent. That, right. That's a big journey. I'll go upstairs yeah. to my kitchen. Silvery, where are you going? <laughs> Uh, I'll go out of uh, my room. And, and look for the leopard, tea. all right? <laughs> yeah, look for the leopard. And please don't say, here, yeah. pussy, here, pussy. That doesn't work. Yes. Right. <laughs> don't dress up as a dog. Okay. <laughs> Oof. All Ouch. Right. All right. Thank you. All right, you. Brilliant. Cheers. Thank you so much. Yes. Take care. And uh, maybe, hopefully, see you another time. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye, guys. Cheerio. Okay, catch us on any of the podcasting apps, please. We beg you, we need you. Send us your questions on Twitter, on Cyrus Says In. Or you can email us, even if you're not female, on says at gmail.com. Feeling overwhelmed, anxious, struggling with too many obstacles, don't know where your life is headed. Well, if you are dealing with one or all of these Tune into the Positively Unlimited podcast because in each episode, I share a life lesson, a life hack, a pro tip that can help you get your life back on track. 
All episodes are available on the IBM website, IBM Podcast app, or wherever it is that you get your podcast from. Peesh e khidmat hai aap ki shaan mein hamare anjuman se. Hi, I am Sadaf and I'm Arshad. Khane ka itihas, economics, policy, psychology, sab hai menu pe. Only on the Nankali podcast every Wednesday, sirf IBM podcast app ya website par ya fir jahan se bhi aap apne podcast sunte ho.